just start, Bruce, because you have such an incredible story from the beginning. Jersey is where you were from originally, right? Correct, yes. Where did it start? How did you get involved with music in the entire scene? Well, I grew up in South Jersey near Atlantic City. And uh, as a kid, I started uh, with piano lessons like a lot of people do. Yeah. Uh, and I did that for, you know, studying classical piano for maybe three or four years. And then I got interested in the drums. Uh, yeah. And an early influence on me at my age was the Beatles. So what, what year was it? The Beatles hit Ed Sullivan show, I know, in February of 64. Yeah. Uh, was that the show that kind of started? The... And that was exactly the thing. I was yeah. probably nine years old then. Oh, great. And, uh, in 64. Yeah. And uh, by the time, you know, they were in their height, I was, you know, a teenager. So they had a huge influence on me. What a powerful rage that was at the time, right? The absolutely. Influence of what it was, yeah. Absolutely. So when I heard them, I knew I wanted to play the drums. <laughs> yeah. They just so you know, that's how it happened for me, too. Man, it's interesting, you know. I mean, you know, as a kid, that was, you know, my idols were the Beatles. And, you know, 30 years later, I'm working with my idol. You know, it's just, it's, how you know, dreams can't come true. How you know? unbelievable it's, with Ringo, right? So you, 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 you're involved with music. How'd you kind of, did you play with bands at that time? You were actively playing? Yeah, I was playing in bands all through junior high school and high school. And then, you know, I was, I ended up going to college in Colorado. For uh, actually environmental conservation and city planning, so that was kind of my backup plan. I <laughs> I didn't really think about pursuing a career in music at that point. And uh, during my time in college, I met a friend of mine who was a uh, electrical engineer, and he ended up uh, building a mobile recording studio. So that kind of got me interested in re the recording aspect. Interesting. And then. Then I started thinking, well, maybe I should do music, and I actually dropped out of school in Colorado, went to Berkeley School of Music for one year. In Boston? In Boston. How cool. And studied jazz piano at that point. So you had studied classical when you were young, and now you're studying jazz piano, so you're, you're into the music thing. You're Right, yeah. Wow. I definitely was more of a player than, than you know, behind the scenes person. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I, I, I took a year of uh, classes at Berkeley, and then... I kind of got disoriented with the uh, jazz world and figured, well, I better finish my degree because I had like a year left in, uh, for the environmental conservation. Anyway, so I finished that up. I got my degree uh, at the University of Colorado. Uh, and in the meantime, my friend who had the mobile studio, uh, when we graduated, he said, well, I'm going to move to Nashville with a mobile truck. And I said, and he invited me to go. And my plan was to go for the summer because I had an outstanding offer for the, the city of Boulder to work with their planning department. Oh, so you're being challenged by two different Right, <laughs> so I had you know, this one professional thing and then my friend was like, let's move to Nashville. I said, well, I'll come for the summer. And the, and the, and the Boulder planning department said, yeah, take the summer off, come back in September and you know, we'll give you a job and all this. And anyway, I went to Nashville and uh, never came back. <laughs> you know, Boulder's a wonderful place. Dude, it, really. it is. It's a great place. Now, the, the mobile unit, was. this was a mobile recording Yeah, it was a 24-track uh, mobile recording studio with tape machines in it and consoles. And you'd and, pull up to some place and, yeah, and, exactly. and record them live? Yeah, the first gig we did was at Red Rocks in Colorado. Really? Which is an amazing place. You Do know? you remember but the band? It was the Little River Band. Really? Yeah. That's <laughs> And funny. John Stewart. John yeah. Stewart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you recorded them, and what happened with the recording? They took the recording and they did their Yeah, now we were doing live radio shows. Oh, I mean, I was just a, uh, an assistant. I was setting up microphones, and, you know, I, wasn't, I, I was, didn't know much about recording at that point. But anyway, we moved to Nashville. After, there was not much work in Colorado, you know. Yeah. So we ended up moving to Nashville. I ended up staying there. And the, uh, the, actually, the mobile studio, after about a year, went out of business. The guy got this, you know, he wanted to do something else, and I ended up staying. And that's really where my training really came in. I ended up uh, working at a studio called Quadraphonic. Really? Which uh, yeah. was kind of a little pocket of rock and roll and pop. They did uh, Neil Young's Harvest Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Well, and Jimmy something. Buffett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Dan Fogelberg worked there. About what year is this now? This is 70s? This, this, no, I've moved there in 1980. Okay. So, so it was yeah. right after... Quadraphonic, their heyday was like 75 through 80, where all those Neil Young was Artists working there yeah, and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. I came in right after that, but it was still kind of known as a, a pop and rock place in, in, the, in you know, the country world.
But anyway, so I started working for their publishing company and they let me produce their demos and stuff and use their studio at night. So that's really where I learned. So that was the beginning part of you now behind the, behind right. the board and you're, you're now mixing and experimenting. And right, exactly. That was basically my training. And now, nowadays kids go to recording schools and stuff. But Absolutely. There, there's many of them, I think. Uh, Sale, future sale, or whatever it is. In, in full Florida, sale, yeah. Full sale, yeah. And uh, so, so here you are. So you, well, you were watching other engineers. Absolutely, that was my training. Yeah. I had mentors, you know, and I had people that I watched. And I mean, that's how back then. That's how you learned the craft. I don't think there was even a Any recording schools? school. I mean, even yeah. when I was at Berkeley, they didn't have a recording program then. Interesting. And uh, yeah. so I, I spent uh, like three years there at Quadraphonic, and then I went independent. And then uh, after five years in Nashville, I decided to move to Los Angeles. So the scene in Nashville was, I mean, Nashville, as we know, Music City, is, is absolutely crazy. Was it, could you feel it growing then or was it kind of stagnant at that time? No, it was definitely growing. In yeah. fact, uh, it was right when that movie uh, Urban Cowboy came out. Absolutely, yeah. And it was a big country uh, you know, it was, it was crossovers, things going on. Big and, push. You know, there yeah, was a lot of yeah. a lot of stuff going on in country yeah. music. And there was a lot of rock and rollers there, too, at the time. Yeah. So we were kind of involved with that as well. Right. And uh, I was producing publishing demos and doing my own stuff at night and, you know, learning from different people. And, uh, and one of the artists I ended up uh, working with there, who was a big influence on me, who was probably the first known artist that actually took interest in what I could do is an artist named Doby Gray, who uh, had the big head drift away. Up there it is, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so he had yeah. a big influence on me. He was the first like legitimate artist that was, you know, was known that, that uh, showed some interest in me, and we ended up writing some songs together. And See, so worked. your ability as not only an engineer, but of course now as a writer now for music, wow, that's powerful. And yeah. what made you make the move to California at that time? Well, I, I mean, things were, kind of stagnant in Nashville a little bit after that and I, I was kind of learning and uh, I wasn't that interested in country music at the time and it was like I had friends out here and I was like well might as well make the move. <laughs> That's amazing. So right? I came out here with basically nothing. I had <laughs> one I had one connection with um, a studio called uh, United Western which is now East West. It's oh, the, the one the Beach Boys did yes. all the work in and Big stuff. Studio. And, uh, a friend of mine in Nashville said, "You go. My friend owns United Western. Go over there, and I'll give you a job." <laughs> so I, I went over there, uh, you know, after I got settled in L.A. And he said, "Well, I need a nice meeting you, but I just sold the studio. Uh, good luck, you know." <laughs> so that was my one connection. So I was on my own. So here you are now. You're in L.A. This is about what, what year is this now? This is 1985. 85. So the recording industry and the label industry is still strong for what it is. Yeah. What was your next move? Uh, I just went around to all the studios in L.A., you know, and tried to get a job as an assistant. I met someone called Rose Mann, who's very well known. She ran the record plant at the time. Right. And uh, she's like the, you know, the first lady of studios. Everyone knows her here. Yeah. And she got me my first job. It was a studio called Babyo. And... Uh, you know, that's where I started and was an assistant there for a few years. Then I br branched out and, you know, the rest is history. You that's know, but, pretty, what yeah. I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, amazed about is just your sheer level of persistence and risk taking. Well, that's it. I mean, anyone in this business, you got you to gotta have a passion for what you're doing. Absolutely. And you got to be willing to put it all on the line. I mean, I had a backup plan, but I never went, went there, you know. They're still but, there in Boulder. They're still there. And yeah, maybe right. if you did call, if you ever felt it, you yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty, probably a little late now. But, uh, but what, what's amazing is that, is, especially the message here with the Legend series with the sessions, is the fact that as future generations watch this and they see the success that you've had and the passion driven feeling that you had to take up the mobile unit, go to Nashville, then move out to LA, this is pretty powerful. Right. So at, now you're in LA, you're working. How'd you end up meeting Ringo? Well, you know, I was working. Uh, I was with that Babyo Studios for maybe two or three years on staff, and then I became independent. I started doing some movie stuff. I did a lot of jingles. I did a lot of Latin music. I, you know, I was doing a bunch of everything, you know, at the time. And uh, it was just happenstance. A friend of mine uh, called me and he said, uh, Ringo's producer needs someone to engineer a couple sessions, and uh, are you available? <laughs> and I said, sure, you know. And I, I met. <laughs> Met the uh, his producer at the time, and um, 
anyway, we hit it off, and I ended up doing two or three albums with him and Ringo, and then he kind of left the picture, that, that producer, and, yeah. and then uh, I kept on with Ringo and ended up co-producing with him. Uh, I mean, listen, Ringo was your guy, as he was my guy, and millions of other drummers oh, yeah. were in there, okay? Oh, I know. You meet him for the first time, he walks in the room. What, what was that feeling like? No, it was very surreal, you know, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's still, I mean, I've known him for over 10, well, about 12, 13 years now. It's, yeah. To me, sometimes when he calls me, it's still surreal, <laughs> you know, because from where I started, you know, he was, that was the total influence, you know. Oh, absolutely. You know, a dear friend of the sessions and myself, too, personally, is Greg Bissonnette. Right. Who's out touring with him and doing his things with him. And, and uh, Yeah, I got him. I got Greg that. Did that you kid, really? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, Greg's an old friend of mine. Greg is, is, is the, He's the best. consummate musician right. at all levels. Aside exactly. from being a great person, right. great drummer, great musician, he really you know, gets the bigger picture of what it is, yeah. which is why he works so much and he's done such to me. He's great, yeah. But, I mean, having Ringo, you're in the room now, you're talking to him. Did you mention about, you know, that date in February of 1964 and how that influenced it all? Or? I told him later on, I'm not that exact time. I didn't yeah. know, you know. Later on, you brought it up. You did tell him. That's amazing. I did. I have a funny story about Greg, though, because Greg used to do a uh, seminar on Ringo. I mean, he knows everything about All the Ringo. Beatles stuff he would do, and I've witnessed many of those and performed with Greg at those. Right. So anyway, I wouldn't. Tunes, yeah. So when, when uh, we suggested uh, Greg for that gig, the all-star band, I told Ringo about, yeah, there's this guy, Greg, who knows, you know, knows everything about stuff, yeah. <laughs> So when they first met, uh, you know, Greg met Ringo, and he was, you know, really happy. And Ringo goes, nice to meet you, Greg. Maybe you can teach me something about myself. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the kind of uh, humor he has, you know. But uh, That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and I've heard that a lot from different guys that have met Ringo. First of all, Ringo, as, as, a, as a musician, is phenomenal. Oh, he's unbelievable. Drummer, writer, singer. I mean, he really is an amazing force in the music yes. industry of what he does. Yeah. And was underrated for many, many years, and it's partly because of the image of being a drummer and, sure. the, and what drummers did, but he really kind of helped raise the standard Absolutely. of drums and what he did. When you're recording with Ringo, what does Ringo demand in the studio? What, what, what does he ask for from you? You know, he's pretty easy going. I mean, he comes from the old school, so he's not like a prima donna at all. Right. right. You know, he's. The, I mean, he wants to hear himself. You know, but uh, he's he's really he's really easy going. You know, I right. can't say that. I mean, the thing about his playing though is great. He's just he's just so in tune with the song he's playing. Yeah. I mean, a lot, that's been said a lot about him, but he he really listens to the song, and he plays to the song. He never overplays. Absolutely. You Absolutely. know, and then just compliments the, the uh, you know the composition he's working on. All the time, he is always, I, 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 I like to think of Ringo as the consummate servant to the music. Absolutely. Only what is needed. Yeah. And nothing more, not one hit more. Right. And Ringo being a unique drummer because he's a lefty, right. playing a right-handed drum set, sure. and he would always start his fills with his left hand. So as drummers analyzing him, it was always a bit tricky because we couldn't totally figure out what he was doing, the uniqueness of how he perceived playing the drums, which was brilliant. In one yes, of those. yeah, it is. You went on to work with so many other people, Ozzy Osbourne and you know Joe Walsh. What was it? One guy, Robert Downey Jr. A lot of people don't realize his level of musicianship. How'd that come about to work with him? Well, I was working with a guy named Mark Hudson who was producing uh, the uh, a Robert Downey Jr. record. But uh, yeah, I was surprised. You know, I, he called me one day. You know, can you do these vocal sessions with uh, Robert Downey? I said sure, and. Uh, and Mark used to have a crazy studio with people walking in and out. I have a, one crazy story. Where I, the, the studio was like, it wasn't a real studio where it had uh, a separate control room. So everyone was in the same room and Robert's singing. And the, and the door to the, his studio was open and people would walk in and out. So anyway, we're... Uh, while he's singing? While he's singing. Well, in this one instance, he was, um, he was doing a vocal take. And he was really, I mean, he was really professional, really great too. But uh, anyway, in walks Tammy Faye Baker. I mean, this is just something really bizarre, you know. And she was just like totally oblivious to <laughs> to what was going on. You know, yeah, hey, how are you all doing? And, and the uh, old, she was the religious. Yeah, you know, right. See that if you go and research what she would do. Oh, that's hysterical. Right, and she'd walk in. And Robert was like, "What the hell's going on?" Here? <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny. You know, one of those, you know, moments of the. But he sings and plays piano and... He uh, plays piano, he sings, and uh, he did, wrote all his stuff. He wrote and, all his stuff, yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, yeah. he's really a talented... I, I was amazed, you know, how, uh, how talented he was. There's some stuff on the internet now of him singing with Sting. Right. And it really is 
deep and and serious and committed as an artist. Yeah, he's music. a real artist. I mean, yeah. he's you know, I think that's where he approaches acting too. That's why he's so good. You know, he's yeah. he's really sensitive soul. You know. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, we did that one record. I, I think I worked on three or four tracks on that album. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was that was an experience. So you went. So I mean, you have such a. It seems like you have such a wide diversity of who you've worked with. I mean, even Ozzy. How did that come about with with Ozzy? It's a whole other different style of music. Yeah, no, I start. Uh, I was with the same producer, Mark Hudson, at the time, right. and we uh, we were doing. We've actually did uh, a couple projects with him. We did a. a an album called Undercover, which was all cover songs, and Ozzy was a huge Beatles fan, believe it or not. Interesting. And we ended up uh, recording and mixing a lot of it at Abbey Road of that record. Really. And we did uh, we did uh, in my life the John Lennon song, and we also did uh, Woman, which is another John Lennon. He Absolutely. was a huge Lennon yeah. fan. One of his later albums, John Lennon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And anyway, we were working there, and I think at the time. Uh, George Martin had just started working on that love project where he remixed all those Beatles songs. And Absolutely. So we got to meet him, and Ozzy was, uh, I mean, a huge fan, so he was over the moon about Real, that. Yeah. So that was a fun experience. And Ozzy, you know, we did, um, we did that one project, and then we did a, a, a musical that never came out yet, which someday I'll probably see the light of day. It was about Rasputin. Really? And it's an amazing project. And Ozzy uh, wrote the whole piece. Ozzy and, and, and a couple other people yeah. wrote the music, and there's like 17 songs written. Really? It's in the can, and I, I, I imagine someday soon it'll come out, you know, but it's, it's really a, a wonderful uh, project. And Ozzy, you know, Ozzy, as unique as a character as he is, you know, how was it working with Ozzy? Was it? Uh, he was great. I mean, yeah. he's, you know, the guy's been, you know, had a successful uh, career in the business for yeah. over 40 years, so yeah. he knows what he wants, he knows who he is. I mean, it's kind of a character he plays, you know. I mean, he's Absolutely. really a sweet guy. He's yeah. really funny. Uh, and at the time, was his wife involved at the time? Yeah, she, no, she absolutely. Was, she was yeah. doing his business stuff yeah. for him, yeah. And she was just kind of uh, becoming famous herself, so the dynamic was... I mean, when I met him, they were still doing the Osborne show on MTV. Right, right. <clears throat> so that was kind of strange, walking yeah. in with cameras all around. and Interesting. Yeah, that was, that was, I think I worked with him the last year he did the Osborne show. Interesting. And he was just getting sober and everything, which was interesting too, because he'd, he'd have a lot of uh, stories that came to him and stuff. That's hysterical. Yeah. Abbey Studios, I mean, you know, be, being in there and, and having the history of that, that studio. Uh, it was a great, that was a really uh, great time in my career, you know, working there. And uh, we were there for like two weeks. I ended yeah. up living next door. They had a flat next the door. Flat, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Put me in. And, and uh, I mean, all the history there. And working, working on, on, you know, on just the equipment that, had been used by the greatness of oh, the and many of the people. What was it like? Is, is does the gear change? You, you you adapt to the gear when you get there. Do you have to do some research on it? Is it no? I mean, similar? they have all the same stuff I've used. You know, pretty much, yeah. I mean, yeah. to me, the important thing about studios, you know, the gears are pretty much. It's, I mean, they maintain their stuff really great there, but mm -hmm. gear is gear. But it's just the you know the amount of service they have, and then just the vibe. There's something about a vibe when you go into an old studio that that has seen so much. Uh, Amazing music being made. Same, same with Capitol Music here, Capitol Records, and East West, which was the United uh, Western. I was talking about when I first came to LA. Right, that right. place I work at a lot now, uh, and that place has a lot. They did Pet Sounds there and the Rolling Stones yeah, and yeah. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So that to me, there's something about the vibes in a room that you kind of feel when you're in there. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's important, I think. How much has Technology. I mean, here we are now in the digital age. How much has technology changed what you do? You went from tape. Is it is a lot of it digital now? How, how do you? Yeah, no, it's all digital. I mean, that's. Yeah. I think that's one of the reasons I've kept working because I've been really steadfast in keeping up with technology. Right, right. I started on tape, cutting two-inch tape. You know, yeah. editing with razor blades. I started. That was you know my whole background. And then little by little, I think when I was doing, I was doing a lot of. Uh, commercials at the time, a program called Sound Tools came out, mm. which was a, just a two-track editor. We used to record into it to edit jingles, and it made it a lot easier because we, you know, do tons of different edits on jingles right, and stuff. Right, right, right. So we started it up with Sound Tools, which, you know, eventually morphed into Pro Tools, which right. is, you know, and now it's like... That's the standard now. That's the standard. Yeah. And 
I mean, I think the last time I recorded a tape was maybe 10 years ago on a Steven Tyler project, but it's been, you know, I don't think anyone does it anymore. Was that a choice from Steven Tyler to want to, is it, is it a, do you sense that as a sound difference? Yeah, it was. It's you know? definitely a sound difference, yeah. especially 10 years ago, the, the digital stuff wasn't as good. And now it's it. really amazing. Now it's like hard to tell, you know, it's, it's well, different, yeah. but it's a lot better than it was. So it's definitely, uh, it's, it's definitely much easier to do digital now, you know. Where do you, where do you see it going? I mean, it's almost hard, we're kind of the same age, to think about where it was to where it is now. Where do you think it's going to go in the next 10, 20 years? I don't know. It's scary. You know, some yeah. of it's scary because they have programs now that will, you know, self, self-mastering self programs and, like, they have, like, these mix programs where you just bring up a kick drum and hit a button and it'll bring up the right EQ and compression for a kick drum, you know. Oh it's like, God. I mean, they'll probably have programs that can mix stuff, but, you know, I don't necessarily like that because it takes the personality away from, I mean, music's all Absolutely. about soul and the personality and, I mean, from from the writers to the musicians playing on it to the producers and engineers, Absolutely. they're all putting a little yeah. bit of themselves in it. That's what makes everything unique. You know, kind of like we talk about now these self-driven cars. Right. You know, the feel of getting behind a car and that feel of doing it now and then being able to program it like a GPS system and then sit back and drive. Yeah. You know, the industry may end up going to that degree. Yeah, there's things wow. that point in that direction, you know. I don't know wow. if that's good or bad. I think it might homogenize the way music sounds, you yeah, know, which yeah. I don't think is really a good thing. Do you think we've compressed sound, you know, from what it was years ago? When you think of the Beatles recordings of what they did on a two-track, right, it's what they, and, and the brilliance of what they created, is it a creativity, you know, is, is, has creativity allowed to grow more or is it challenging at times? Or? It is challenging. Mm. I think the thing with people's ears get used to certain sounds. Mm. You know, the, but the bands we grew up listening to, the, the music breathed, breathed a lot. Yeah. And the tempos fluctuated. Everything wasn't perfectly in tune. Now yeah. people listen to music and a lot of the pop music is like, Everything's quantized. Yeah. So it's there's, exactly, there's drum machines. Yeah. Everything's tuned to exact note. You know, there's right. really no fluctuations in that, right. and everything gets kind of put in a box. You know, and everything sounds the same. I mean, there's there's a big resurgence of vinyl now. People are buying vinyl. I right. think young kids, when they hear that for the first time, are like, "Wow, you know, <laughs> this is really great." So <laughs> I don't think that'll ever go away, and yeah. hopefully it won't. Yeah, yeah. But. Uh, you know, people's ears get tuned for, you know, they like everything right in tempo, but I think there will be a brush back from that, I think, at some point, you know. Well, that'd be, that'd be really interesting to go back to what we had grown up with. D did, you, did you think of your career as, as a career where you wanted a map out, I want to work with this person and try and do this person, or did you kind of, did it kind of happen? It just happened. It just happened, know? right? That's I've been amazing. independent, and you just kind of go where the flow takes you, you know, and uh, I mean, luckily I got involved with Ringo, and that was probably 12 or 13 years ago, and that opened up a lot of doors, you know, his yeah. his network is amazing, you know, and I ended up working with Joe Walsh through him. And through him, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and many other people, you know, I've met a lot of the people in the all-star bands, uh, Richard Page and Todd Rundgren and uh, Edgar Winter, old, people wow, like yeah. that. Are yeah, all, yeah. I've met all those people through Ringo, you yeah, know, and I ended up working with Quite a few of them. Boy, the ultimate network person is. Yeah, I mean, it's, it all really is. lead to Ringo when it comes to. Well, it is. You know, it's just, yeah, yeah. you know, and 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 the great thing about doing records with him is like, if he wants someone on the record, just gets he just him. calls him. It's like, who's going to say no? You know. And so, you know, the the experiences I've had working with him has been amazing. I think one of the most amazing experiences I had on, uh, I think it was two records ago, a record called Why Not. He called Paul. Paul was in town at the same time. It was during the Grammys, and I think everyone was in town. He asked him to play bass on a song. We spent the whole day together, me, Ringo, and Paul. No cameras. It was definitely one of the highlights of my career. How you know? powerful is that? And, uh, and Paul was just amazingly humble. I mean, for, for a guy who was like, you know, Probably the, the you know most well-known, incredible musician on the planet. You absolutely, know, he was just absolutely. So humble and you know, easy to work with, and yeah. just you know, just so great. Which says a lot to the future generation about the greatness of what these gentlemen have done. They Absolutely. literally changed the face of music, Absolutely. the world at that time, and continue to yeah. with their pace even in their their seventies now. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, they keep on coming out with new formats. They just Absolutely. started streaming the stuff and. 
And they're like the top streaming act now. Yeah, I think. yeah. It's just it's men. Kids are like young kids are starting to get into. I mean, it's amazing the the uh, the trajectory of their music. Bruce, were there any challenging times in your career where you felt, gosh, things are getting confused and I'm not sure where I'm going? That it made you kind of rethink maybe what you were doing. Yeah, I think every uh, independent. I've been independent for probably 25 years now. Yeah. So there's always those slow periods you have and uh, when the phone stops ringing a little bit. And I think, I think the one point I got a little frustrated, I was doing a lot of uh, commercials, which, I mean, they paid the bills, but uh, artistically they weren't as challenging yeah, yeah. and fulfilling to me as, as uh, work on records and films and stuff. So I was doing a lot of that for a few years and I was kind of questioning you know my path at that point and then you know one thing led to another and some other cool projects came up so I mean I've always been whenever I got to the point I never got to the point where I was gonna give it up you know yeah I mean some always kind of came along in my career that uh, it made it happen yeah, yeah it, it was <laughs> just really amazing you know I think when you make a commitment to it and your heart's in the right place you know and you do the work and you're prepared to uh, to do the work, uh, I think things will happen for you, you know. Well, you've definitely been the one that has clarified perseverance to keep on going. In closing, if you could think about the fact that we've got, you know, the future generation watching this and kind of seeing exactly what you have done in your career and following your career and seeing the magic that you have had in your life and continue to do, what would you say to that next generation to kind of give them an understanding of what might be, what they could prepare for maybe? I think the main thing is to have passion in what you're doing and to love doing it for the sake of making music and interacting with different people and uh, not get into this business for the f fortune and fame, you know. I mean, yeah. A lot of people think, oh yeah, I'm going to be on American Idol and two days later I'll be famous and all this, you know. <laughs> you really got to love what you're doing. Uh, you got to have a passion for uh, either making music or recording or playing music. And uh, I think that'll take you a long way, you know, if your heart's in the right place. Well, that really is powerful. It sounds totally that what you have done in your life, if you've done it for the love of doing it. On behalf of the sessions, Bruce, we thank you so much for your time and continued success to all that you're doing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks so much. Pleasure. <laughs>